Dr. Erin Gravel, and I am the MAT coordinator of our uh, uh, multiple subjects licensure program at Southern Oregon University. And I've been the coordinator there for about five years. And prior to that, I was the chair. And then prior to that, I was a newer faculty member. Um, I love this conference. My first time coming to this conference Oh, really gotta cool. love technology. <laughs> Sorry, Erin. <laughs> um, actually, I'm going to take that pause really quick to just do some quick housekeeping. Um, so everyone, a reminder that if you would like to use the closed captioning, you want to click on the more button at the bottom of your toolbar, where you will be able to turn on the uh, view full transcript, which will open the transcript up in the chat section. Um, you can also um, hide sub uh, click on show subtitles, which I believe will bring those subtitles at the bottom of the screen um, as it would on television. Um, and then also a reminder that this session is being recorded and um, to please keep yourself muted unless otherwise prompted by our presenter. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I was just saying, I love this conference. I, I attended it for the first time about three years ago and I really enjoyed meeting other women and talking to other women about what they do in higher ed. And at the time I noticed there weren't many professors um, presenting at the conference. And I thought it would be really great because I made so many great connections between um, administrators and um, those that worked in student relations. I thought it'd be great to bring the professor's perspective to the conference as well. And I also, during uh, one of the breakout sessions, had a wonderful conversation with some women who actually introduced me to life coaching, which I had never heard about, and a podcast they listened to. And so I started listening to it. And I actually, because of that interaction at this conference, also became a life coach. And I'm a women's life coach too now. So that's, um, I really thank this conference for introducing me to that. So um, what we're talking about today is how to form meaningful relationships with students in distant learning courses. And I want to talk to you about how I have done that with my students, but I also want you to experience what my students experience when they're in a class with me. So we're gonna start out, I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see my presentation. Let's see here. And we're going to start out with a icebreak, an icebreaker that I had my students do last quarter. So what I'd like you to do in the chat is I'd like you to write which number you are today from one to nine, looking at the rubber duckies. How are you feeling? One to nine. And um, if, if you'd like to share why you're feeling that way today. So if you're a one and you're feeling on top of the world and things are fantastic, that's fantastic, why? Um, and if you're at a nine and you're feeling like you're really sinking and kind of going under today, um, to share that with us too, if you're comfortable doing that. So please go ahead and just share in the chat right now what number you are um, and if, if possible, why? And we'll give you just a minute or two to do that. Nice. Okay, so Michelle said a six, Marisol said three, feel, starting to feel good, but getting tired, I understand completely. Uh, oh, Victoria from Southern Oregon, that's where I'm from. A lot of projects happening, but getting inflated with more air because of the conference, that's fantastic. Uh, Michaela says three, let's see here. Number two from Shannon, I'm content enjoying the snow, but missing in person, me too. Karen's a two, Jeanette's a four, feeling okay, but your house is super cold. Oh no, I'm <laughs> sorry to hear that. Uh, Julia's feeling pretty good, but a little bit tired, deflated after lunch. I know I always do that to myself after lunch. I get a little bit of a, a slump there. Uh, Lori says a three, dinner with her bestie tonight. That's awesome. Sarah's a six, working full-time and doing a part-time MBA and barely staying above water today, I can imagine. Kathy's about a four, not great, but not sinking. We'll move to a low number if it starts snowing in Portland, I understand. Hannah's happy to be at the conference, but getting overwhelmed by classroom projects. Rebecca's a three, good, but have a lot to do. 
Jennifer's just back from a nice brisk walk. That's fantastic. I was just talking to Shania about how she goes for a run on her lunches. Uh, Maria is a nine. She has a lot of schoolwork to get through for this week and feeling um, behind, but been waking up every day at five to get through the work while also balancing life. Good for you, Maria. I do the same thing. I get up at five every morning and I get so much done. Um, Ez is a two. Pepper is seven, feeling a bit underwater. And Emily is a three, a little bit tired this afternoon. So um, thank you for sharing. It's nice to know, starting out kind of where everybody's at, how you're feeling. Um, this is an activity I do with my students or a variation of it that I do at the beginning of every class. It's a check-in, it's just a way to reconnect, see how they're doing, um, gives me an idea of what their participation might be like for the day. And if we are in a remote environment where we're not meeting synchronously online, I can still do these kind of check-ins through forums, um, which helps too. So I can just see where my students are at and it really helps with building community. Um, and then it looks like Emily just said three, a little tired this afternoon and Carrots said two, doing pretty well, so. Thank you again for sharing. I'm at a one or two. Um, I've had a busy, busy morning with meetings. Um, and I know probably after this, I will be a four, but I'm looking forward to laying down on the couch and reading a book after this. So, okay, so I accidentally went back. Okay, so what I'd like you to do very, um, well, I just wanted to get an idea of where you are and your institution. So maybe um, if just a few people would like to share with us your name, your position at your institution and what you hope to learn today. So maybe just for two minutes, if there's a few brave people that would wanna share with the group, uh, your name and institution, what you do there and something you'd like to learn from today's presentation. Hi, my name is Michelle and I'm at Oregon State University. Um, I'm an associate professor and I teach um, in a STEM discipline. And uh, two years ago, I started doing um, uh, e-campus teaching as well as on-campus teaching. And then of course, this whole year, uh, we've had to do remote um, on-campus teaching. Uh, and it seems uh, very difficult to stay connected to the the <laughs> the students in this type of teaching environment. So um, I'm really looking forward to uh, some suggestions. Thank you. Welcome, Michelle. And I felt the same way you did this summer. And luckily, somebody like you at my university gave some fantastic trainings that helped me do a lot of the different things I'm doing in this presentation today. So hopefully you get some good resources you can take with you and um, share. Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Kirshner at Portland State University. Um, I work at finance and administration, so I don't teach at all. I'm not on the academic side, but I am also a student. And I've taken some online classes, some classes that we've done that have been fully online or remote. And I've had good experience and I've had experiences. <laughs> and quite frankly, I'm curious to hear what it's like on the other side of the desk. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you, Kathy. And hopefully, if we have some times for question and answers at the tail end of the presentation, you can share some of your experiences. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to share? I can share. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Marwa. I'm a graduate student at Oregon State University and a graduate teaching assistant for the College of Pharmacy at Oregon State. Um, I also serve as a teaching assistant for a couple of our graduate programs courses, so I get to engage with students that way and the students that I advise in pharmacy. Um, I'm just really excited to kind of, like what Kathy said, learn about um, the other aspect, the other side of things and um, how professors are doing things to engage students and um, I'm trying my best to keep my students engaged, um, both my advisees and the students in my classes. So just looking to get a couple of um, tips and tricks to engage them more. Great, thank you so much for coming. And I hope I give you some, again, some solid resources that you can implement right away in your work. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you for sharing. Looks like there were a couple in the chat as well. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't see those. Um, so let's see here. Kareth from PSU is the development, development administrator and scholarship coordinator, also a graduate student in remote classes are great. 
but for my learning style, I really dislike online classes. I don't retain the information. And Kara, that's something I hear from a lot of students because I've been asking my students, what do you like, what don't you like? And that's something I think a lot of students can relate to. So yes, absolutely. And then um, Simone says, me too, Kathy. I'm an arts marketer box office manager for SOU. Awesome. Um, and want to translate the info in this class to managing my staff of 10 remotely. Oh, awesome, Simone, that's great. Um, and then Maria says, uh, let's see here. Yes, it at Marwa, yes, it is. There is an added layer of stress as I try to go through my internship by remote as well and finding ways to gain the skills I will need after graduation, which is coming up and excited yet nerve wracking. Yeah, Pepper. Well, Pepper, congratulations on your upcoming graduation. And Kareth, it's exciting that it's snowing outside in Oregon City. Thank you. Please hang in there with us for just, I don't know what time it is, but just a few, 45 more minutes and then you can go out and play in the snow. <laughs> okay, so um, moving on then, let's see here. I want you to consider how important is creating relationships with students. So according to Miller, who wrote a really great book that I happen to have right here called Minds Online, Teaching Effectively with Technology, before COVID, only 31% of college students reported taking one fully online class, only 31%. And now we know because of COVID, most college students have taken at least one online class, if not all of their classes online. And they're starting to come to appreciate the many benefits that online instruction offers, because there are some benefits, like with anything, there, there's benefits and then there's also costs. And so as instructors, now that we've experienced COVID and we see that online instruction may become more of the future of instruction, not 100% instruction, but we were probably going to start seeing in higher ed more online instruction. Um, it's important that we are able to create a community of learners. And Malloy, Marinek, and Gambrel describe a community of learners as a group of people who share values and beliefs about learning and who actively engage in learning from one another. What Miller found in her book is that although most instructors are now teaching online, a great majority have never learned how to teach online. They don't know effective online teaching strategies, which a lot of you that are taking classes online have seen. And so what we're going to focus on is creating those relationships with students because relationships are the heart of our work with students. And without a relationship, our students aren't going to learn anything from us online or face-to-face. So today we're going to talk about how do we create these relationships and what can we do before we even work with students to prime the relationship, to get it going, like to, to set the tone before you even start class. How do we maintain them both inside and outside class? And then what are you currently doing if you are teaching and is it working for you? And if not, are there some ways we might be able to tweak it to make it work for you? So we are going to, let's see here. There we go. We're going to look at right now, where are you currently at when it comes to working remotely with students? And we are going to do a Kahoot. So please take out your phones and go to Kahoot. I'm gonna stop sharing this so that I can click on Kahoot and pull that screen up for you so you know what number it is. Okay. And let's see here, it's loading the game pin. Here we go. Let me just find you all again and share the screen. There we go. So on Kahoot, you go to game pin 8124051. And if you haven't done Kahoot before, it's a really great, um, app that you can do. You don't have to download it on your phone to play it, and you can use your phone as well as your computer to do it. It's kahoot.com, and you just click on play, and then you create a name for yourself. And in your classes, you can have pre-assigned names, or you can have um, the students create their own names depending on the maturity level of your students. 
Oh, Amazing Wallaby, that's a fun one. Amazon Raccoon. I think some of you have done this before and you like have that Kahoot name ready to go. Oh, I bet, I wonder, are they assigning you names when you go on? That might be why they're all animals. <laughs> I'm like, these are really creative, wow. Okay, so we have about 18 now. We'll wait a couple more seconds for other people to get in. So while people are um, logging in, I believe, I forget which book it was, a research, but a lot of research around um, culturally relevant pedagogy talks about how gamifying education is a way to create more opportunities for students to be engaged in learning and that it's a very effective way also for retaining short term memory and making it transferring it to long term memory. So when you're doing reviews and having some kind of fun game like this where students are competing, um, it actually helps them retain what it is they've learned. And so I will use a Kahoot usually as a way to review information from the last class or review um, reading that the students have done as a way to refresh their memory and also sometimes as a way to actually create a presentation around their answers from Kahoot. Okay, so I think there's still a few people that haven't logged on. There's been assigned, okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, other players can join us after we um, have started too though. So here's a poll. Or high or no. Okay, so 12 said yes and five said no. Um, so yes, quite a few of you did have to transition. And I'm just wondering for it, one of you that's had to transition that's teaching, what was that like for you? If maybe one of you could sh share with us, was that stressful? Was it pretty easy? What was that like for you to make that transition? Anyone? Okay. So I had to make the transition in my teaching and um, it was really stressful for me because what I tried to do is I tried to take what I do in my face-to-face -face classes and just merge it into what an online course would look like. And I quickly found out that you can't really do that. It's very hard to take the same lesson plans I would teach in a three hour face-to-face -face class and put it online and expect the students to get the same thing. Okay, so we'll go to our next one. Are you currently teaching online? Yes or no? Okay, so 14 are not and six are. Okay, that's good to know. Um, even I think as Simone mentioned, some of these different things we're doing, you can take and put into practice with working in a corporate environment or with teams of people. It doesn't just have to be through teaching. It's just building connections. So even if you're not teaching online, you can still take something from this course and apply it in building relationships. Okay, last one. Which of the followings do you do to build relationships with students before your first class meeting? So if you are teaching, what do you do? Do you send a welcome email? Do you send a video introducing yourself in the course? Do you open course early with the syllabus or other? Okay, so send a welcome email that's done a lot and that is a really great way of introducing yourself and letting students know um, who you are and what the course is about. Uh, I see here that one person sends a video introducing yourself in the course, which is fantastic. That's something I'm actually going to talk about next about a wonderful way to start building um, 
community and relationships with your students. And then open course with course syllabus. I know a lot of instructors do that so students can review the syllabus before it's even time to start the course, which is also a great um, teaching strategy. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and go back into the slideshow. Thank you for playing along. It's good to know where everyone's kind of at. And unfortunately, I'm not able to see my slideshow right now. Um, are you, let me check. You should be able to share screen. Let's see here. Um, is, this, is the share screen button still at the bottom down there for you? Uh, let's see here. Yes. Is it still there? I don't see it there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, no. I can open it really quick again. I've got it right here. Just There we are. Okay, we're back. So what I wanted to talk about next is building community before the term even starts. And this is where I started making some real changes in my, um, in my actual classes with students. And the first thing I started doing was um, a welcome video with email. So I did, a, um, I did an email with um, a video instead of just from um, just sending an email. I used to just send an email like we had talked about, but I created this video introducing myself and what the expectations were from the course. And I found it was a really great way to introduce myself to students and let them get to know me a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the video. I created it with Adobe Spark, which if you haven't used Adobe Spark, it's free. Um, of course, you can also get a, a membership and have more applications available to you, but it's really easy. It took me, I think, 25 to 30 minutes to create this video and each quarter I can change out certain slides according to each class and update it. So I'm going to go ahead and share that now. Can you see that? The new one? Awesome. Okay. Hello and welcome to Ed363 Reading and Language Arts Methods. I'm your course instructor, Dr. Erin Gravel. I am so excited to be working with you this quarter in Reading and Language Arts Methods. This course is designed to give you a foundational knowledge of the developmental stages of children in acquiring literacy skills, exploring literacy theories, and effective practices in teaching the value of literacy to children from birth to third grade. In this course, you'll read up-to-date research on literacy, explore how literacy is taught in schools, and through hands-on learning activities, become knowledgeable and skilled in the basics of early childhood elementary literacy. You will also be expected to evaluate and explore the role literacy plays in your life and the impact this has on your future teaching. We will meet on Mondays from 1.30 to 4.20 synchronously via Zoom. The Zoom link is in your course syllabus as well as at the top of our Moodle site. Please plan on spending at least three to four hours in addition to class time working on homework and other course assignments. Before our first course meeting, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. I taught kindergarten and first grade in a district east of Seattle for many years. This is my 11th year as faculty at the university and is my fifth year as the coordinator of our Masters of Arts in Teaching program. I designed this course when I started teaching at the university and have continued to teach and refine it over the years. We teach from who we are and I am very committed to a work home life balance. I have two wonderful teenage daughters pictured with me here as well as my husband and this was taken at our wedding this past summer. We also have a foster son that we adore, four dogs and a cat. We definitely keep ourselves very busy with family life. Um, when I'm not teaching or spending time with family, I enjoy reading and going for walks and cooking. 
great way to get started in preparing for the course on Monday is to review the short syllabus that's included in this email and then to sign into our course Moodle site and take a look around to familiarize yourself with the site and how it's set up. Then you'll want to read the full syllabus and take the syllabus extra credit quiz, which will be available until Monday at 930 when class starts. I hope you enjoy the rest of your break and I look forward to seeing you on Monday. Thank you. Okay. So out of curiosity, what did you notice I included in that video that would help build relationships with students? A bio, yeah, easy set a bio. Personal information, background information, syllabus, extra credit quiz, such a good idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanaya. I just started doing that this year, talking about my family information about me and my life. So showing them I'm a human and I have a life outside of school or outside of the, the university. Photos, recommendations for getting started. So they knew explicitly, okay, this is what I need to do to be set myself up to be successful um, in this course. Uh, Kathy said enough of all of it to make a student curious for more and not oversharing anything. So yeah, so it's if I were starting a course, what would I need want to know about my, my instructor? And also what would I need to know to be successful in the course? And so since I've started doing this this year, I have formed such close relationships with my students. And I know it's not just this video, but it's such a great way to introduce myself to students, to let them know what I value, to let them know who I am as a person, and also that I have high expectations of them and their participation in our course, but that I'm also willing to do the work to help them be successful. Oh, and then, yes, Shania, you said uh, reminding them about work-life balance is also so great for students to hear from instructors. Absolutely, it, it is. And I, you know, I firmly believe we, we do teach from who we are as people. And so modeling that for our students and showing them how I do that myself, um, I try to do that, especially as the coordinator of our program, so. Thank you so much for, for watching. I didn't know when I created it that I'd be sharing it like that, but hey, that's, that's what happens. Um, so the next thing I wanna move on to is uh, something I also started doing this year that was very, very useful in, um, in my work with students. And that was to create a liquid syllabus. Has anyone ever heard of a liquid syllabus before? If you have, feel free to speak up or just go ahead and put in the chat what a liquid syllabus is if you've heard of it before, or if you're familiar with it. Okay. Sounds messy. <laughs> it's a messy process, that's for sure. <laughs> Yes, um, so a liquid syllabus is really interesting and I didn't realize why they called it liquid until I started making one and found out what the value of one is. So I'm gonna share my screen here. And what it is, is it's a graphic of the most important pieces of your syllabus for students that they can access from anywhere. So a lot of times our syllabi, oops, sorry didn't mean to share that right now. Um, a lot of times our syllabi are long, can be kind of dense, hard to read. Students don't know where to start, where to end, how to pick out the most important parts of it. And it's only available through our Moodle site or through Blackboard. So for them to go, you know, say it's a Monday night, 10 o'clock, they're thinking, what's the reading for class tomorrow? Oh, I've got to log in. I've got to get to Moodle. I've got to do all this. And so with the liquid syllabus, they can actually access it just from their phone. It's a link. So they can access at any time. And what we're finding with a lot of students is most of them are attending classes with their phones or through an iPad or something similar, not through an actual computer. So having a liquid syllabus, they can access at any time from those different types of, um, from um, a phone or from an iPad is really important. So here's my liquid syllabus. And I'm going to admit my normal syllabus for this class is 15 pages. Now, 
a page and a half is SOU's policy on plagiarism, COVID, all those kinds of things. So it's about 13 and a half pages. And I do use big font in my assignments and spelling out what's due each week. But there's a lot of information in that syllabus. And so it did take me quite a bit of time, oops, sorry, to create this liquid syllabus. I don't know why this keeps changing on me. Oh my goodness. I just want to get back to that one. Um, but once I did, I was so happy with it. So can you see this? Okay, so here's my liquid syllabus. And so at the very beginning, it has my name with a link to my email. So they can email me at any time from their phone or from their iPad. Here's the Zoom link. So again, they don't have to go looking around for a Zoom link right before class starts, it's right there. I also say here that the full syllabus is available on the course Moodle site. And if you notice in the video, the full syllabus is what the syllabus quiz is on, not the liquid syllabus, because I want them to look at this and then dig into the main parts of the syllabus after looking at this. So I took different pieces of what I thought were the most important part of the syllabus, and then you add graphics to make it more visually appealing. So I took the objectives from literacy, the course requirements. So again, to be successful in this course, you should a lot of times Instructors assume students know what they need to do to be successful, but as students will tell you, every instructor is very different on what it takes to be successful. So you telling them this is what you need to do to be successful in my class is like, oh, okay, now I don't have to spend time and energy figuring it out. You just told me, so that's what I need to do. Um, so download files, read material, submit assignments, participate, collaborate, and be on time. Then all the assignments we have in class are right there. And I also talk about when it's due, how many points, and what pages of the actual syllabus it's on. And that's for all of the assignments. And then because we do have a lot of um, collaboration assignments, and students sometimes feel like we do too much group work, I wanted to point out that most of their assignments were actually independently prepared assignments so that when they start feeling like they're doing too much group work, they can remember, oh yeah, only 15% of this class is actually group work because Sometimes it feels like more, I know. <laughs> and then again, here's attendance and participation and what happens. Here's your responsibilities, my responsibilities, my office hours, the link to my office hours, um, how to address me in emails, just so that students, I think sometimes they really wonder, do I call you doctor? Do I call you Aaron? How, what, you know, and in person, they can call me Aaron in class. I'm not really big on being called Dr. Gravel, but, when I found when we have um, email communications, it's very informal and I really feel like they need to get practice in being more professional. So I do ask them to, to say, dear Dr. Wild or dear Dr. Gravel or dear Aaron, just so it's a little bit more than, hey, you, <laughs> when's this assignment due? Oh, thank you, uh, Kathy. She said she likes my uh, graphics, lots of white spaces, easy for eyes to follow, exactly. Um, Kara says it's amazing. I wish my professors were using this. I know. And the thing is, again, like the video, once you've created a template for it, you can kind of change things in and out for different classes so that you're not recreating the wheel every single time. Um, oh, I'm glad to hear that, Simone. If you want help with adapting the liquid syllabus to a training handbook, I'm happy to help you with that. I, I learned a lot through the process. Um, so yeah, so that was this piece of it. And this was pick to chart. Um, and it's great for making graphics. I had not heard of it before. I went through my um, one hour training last summer, very much like this training right now or this, this um, presentation. And I have to be honest, my students are showing up a lot more prepared. They're um, interacting more, they seem more at ease, they're talking to me about things they never talked to me about, they'll stay after class to ask about things that are class related and then share other things. And I really think it's because I've shared so much information with them before we even started the quarter and let them know that I truly am committed to their success, that they feel that and they want to show up and they want to do their best and they know that that's expected, but they also see me doing my best too. And that's a big part of it as well. Okay, so any questions about that, about either of those actually, the videos or the 
Oversharing and over communicating for online class is so helpful for students. That is so true. Easy. Absolutely. I actually did a, um, I asked my students yesterday because I knew that I was doing this presentation today. So at the end of class yesterday, I said, what is the most helpful thing an instructor can do to build a relationship with you or to ensure your success? And I'm just going to read a few of them. And then I will go back to sharing the last part here of the presentation, because I think it's really interesting, the things that they really value in I'm still trying to, there we go, that they really value in online classes. So the biggest thing that the instructors do to create relationships and make learning engaging, my students, it was hands down, um, it was hands down um, breakout rooms. They want to communicate, they want to interact, they want to touch base with each other, they wanna share ideas. Like in class we say turn and talk or work with a small group or work with a partner. And I think sometimes we forget on Zoom, we can do that, we have breakout rooms. It's very easy to auto create breakout rooms, it takes two seconds and saying, okay, go out in a room, share this. And actually for my check-ins, I often will have them check in in a breakout room rather than whole group because I've noticed that in whole groups, a lot of screens are still turned off, people aren't as engaged, but as soon as you put them in a breakout room, their screens are on, they're talking, they're engaging, and they're sharing. And so I will often have them do things in breakout rooms and then bring them back and talk about it whole class. And so the breakout rooms was the top thing that my students said. Someone else said, communicating through email consistently and reminding us constantly of due dates as it is really easy to get lost and confused in the online schooling world. And that's so true. I have had so many students and I used to think, oh, well, you know, you're a student, you're a graduate student, you can figure it out, you have the syllabus. And now I'm realizing, yeah, but they have four or five other ones too that they need to go through and they really are confused. And so I've really tried to be a lot more understanding of the fact that this is a hard time for, for students and they're trying their best and they really want to, to do their best given where they're at right now. And sometimes we have to just be understanding that it is a difficult time for them. Um, so as far as community, building community during the term, there's no secret. I wish there was, but it's showing up, it's responding to emails, it's being there, it's staying after class, it's when a student emails and says, hey, I can't make it to office hours, but can you meet with me some other time, saying yes and sending a Zoom link or scheduling a phone call instead of just emailing back and forth. Making that personal connection is what's really key um, with students. Um, and then uh, let me see here, what else did my students say? I, a lot of them really do appreciate the check-ins because it's their way of bonding with each other. And then they also said access to resources that they wouldn't have otherwise. Students really do like access to a lot of resources. Okay, so um, another thing that's really important about the liquid syllabus that I forgot to mention is trying to keep out the academic language or jargon. I think sometimes we, you know, we're so wrapped up in higher education and we use acronyms like crazy because why not? Um, <laughs> and it's just, it's one of those things where it's like trying to make things as succinct and clear as possible is really what our students need. They're, they don't need us to, to just basically copy and paste from the syllabus and make it uh, the same thing that the syllabus was. Um, and then I also had mentioned the extra credit quiz. Uh, that is important. I do try to do that before class starts because I want students to review the quiz, but I don't want them to be penalized if they don't have time to. I send out the video, the um, liquid syllabus and the email about a week before class starts and then let them know they have a week to do that extra credit syllabus. Um, and what I found is most of them do it. So then when we have our first class meeting, I'm not sitting there having to review the syllabus for an hour with them, which no one enjoys, I don't think, I don't know. But I know as a teacher, that's the thing I always dread about the first day of class is having to go through the syllabus um, bit by bit. Uh, I love taking questions and offering explanations and expanding on stuff, but just reading over the objectives and stuff just it doesn't feel like a good use of time. So that's where we're at. Um, Again, the check-ins, huge in maintaining that community, 
having um, breakout rooms, letting students get up and do dance breaks. I have not done this, but I've been in trainings where they've done this and it's fantastic where you say, okay, we're gonna take a dance break and you know, when the song's over, come back to your seat. Uh, that's great. Um, some people dance, some people don't, but it just gives students an excuse to stand up, move around, uh, giving several smaller breaks instead of one big break. So I used to, I teach a three hour class and I used to give one 15 minute break in the middle of it. And now I try to give two or three, five to 10 minute breaks, depending on where my students are at and how um, they seem to be feeling. And so I'm just wondering in closing, what will you take from today's presentation that you could use in your own work with students and any questions you still have? So I'd love to hear if any of these would work in your work with students. I know Simone said that she's actually going to um, do some of this with her, her staff, which is great. Could you see yourself using this in another way? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Oh, I have a question. Can I just, can I just jump in? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm also staff. I work at Portland State University. Um, I mostly work, so I'm the department manager um, at PSU, and I mostly work with faculty, obviously, some students, but I'm wondering how um, to share some of these ideas with our faculty, because I know some of our faculty do a great job, um, but what would you recommend, you know, kind of sharing some of this stuff with our faculty that could, could benefit? You know, that's a great question. I don't know if um, PSU, you said you're from PSU, is that right? Yeah. Um, do you have like a all faculty training day or anything like that, that you do at your college? We have faculty meetings, you know, as part of our department. Um, and I know that PSU definitely does larger, you know, faculty trainings and offerings, but. Yeah. I'm not involved with those. Yeah, that makes sense. So when I learned this was during one of our university-wide training days, it's like a two-day conference kind of thing where you get to pick and choose which ones you go to. But I could see creating even short videos or um, like 10 to 15 minute trainings on these and then offering support to faculty that's interested. And really it's just about knowing who's doing it and how it's done and having some time to play around with it. So maybe even, maybe in one of your faculty meetings, having people practice the Adobe Spark and making those videos and seeing, wow, this is actually pretty easy because they could probably create the whole video during your faculty meeting. So just seeing that it actually is pretty interactive and easy and the benefits of it. Yeah, that's good, thank you. Absolutely. Oh, I think Sarah, you would also ask if you have to create everything in addition to what you have to do for Moodle. Can you expand on that question a little bit? No, sorry. Yeah, because we have a, we don't have Moodle, but we have something a similar program that all the faculty you know use. So students log in. So do you have to create all of your information in Moodle and then also create all a whole separate website with all of that information through the um, what do you, what is oh. the, the picto chart? Like, do you have to do a whole separate? Yeah. You know, yeah, I couldn't They have work to do that. Yeah. But, you know, I found that there, if you even um, type in liquid syllabus, there are um, different types of pre done formats and stuff that you probably could copy and paste into. And picto chart might have something like that as well. So that might be another idea. Yeah, good. Thank you. Question. Yeah. Uh, it looks like uh, Victoria, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just oh. going to kind of add to, hi, Erin. <laughs> Hi, oh, yeah, so you. Um, so I was going to say like another way to promote like from Sarah's question. So like at SOU, we actually have a Center for Advancement of Teaching and Learning. And so that's a really great, I would say, like particularly faculty center resource where um, anytime like faculty members like need like how to do or like um, spreading knowledge, like 
I'm a staff member, so I, I'm very limited in my connections with faculty, but I know the um, Hart Wilson, who's one of our coordinators. And so anytime I have ideas for faculty, it's like, hey, would you be willing to do this? Or like, do you know other faculty members who would be willing to collaborate on this resource? And like kind of ideas spread from there. So I think any opportunity, if you do have something similar on your campuses for um, like a hub, I would say for like, um, or even like marketing within like student affairs staff, like if you have that, I think that would be a great collaborative resource. Well, and I know for myself, thank you so much for sharing that Victoria and Hart actually trained me in both of those. She's amazing. <laughs> um, I also have shared the video just with other faculty I work with, like because I'm the MAT coordinator, I've shared it with some of our instructors in our MAT program and said, hey, I shared this with students. Um, I also created some other videos that I send out as a morning, a Monday message to our MIT students. So it's a Monday email we send out every Monday, just saying hi, updating them and offering some inspiration. And once faculty started seeing that I was creating those videos and it was informational, but it, and it seemed somewhat professional, I guess, um, they're like, hey, how'd you do that? So I think too, just setting the example and doing it and sharing it, um, also helps because then people think oh wow that's that's really cool or that could be useful for me and there's been a lot of uh, research behind just doing impromptu videos for your students to connect with them and just say hey how's it going and showing again your personal side and showing that you have a life but also sending them a reminder about something important or something like that any other questions um, I was just going to say, um, I'm currently a student and um, I have an instructor, I've never experienced this before, but she sends out um, a weekly little update that's about five minutes long. Sometimes it's an audio, sometimes it's a video. She says, hey, hope you all are doing great. Um, here's what to expect from class this upcoming week. And that has been just really awesome. Everyone is really more engaged in this class that I've ever seen in an online class. So I thought that was a very helpful thing as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of instructors doing that. And that's something I want to start doing too. It's like you kind of build up <laughs> as you go along, you take different bits and pieces. And I've, I've heard that that's just, you know, and you just do one time through with recording it. You don't have to make it perfect. It doesn't have to be anything where you don't make mistakes and stuff. It's just good enough so that you're, you're connecting with your students and checking in with them and letting them know that you're still there for them. Thank you, Simone, for saying that I was setting a tone for my uh, being an instructor who cares about her students. I absolutely do. And I think as instructors, that's kind of a hard thing for us too, is we do care about our students, but sometimes we're not sure how to show that we care about them and the best way to do that. And so we have to find ways that, that work for us and we're comfortable with, but will also be useful to them. Yeah, Kathy. Um, I think unfortunately, at least based on my experiences, you are probably the exception, or I'm going to say the trendsetter, as opposed to the rule. Um, I am an older, non-traditional student. I have decided that before I die, I am going to get my bachelor's degree. Don't know, don't know when. Mm -hmm. Might be two days before I croak off. I don't know, but I'm going to get it done. Good for you. Um, but I had an experience um, spring term that of course I was taking, it was, you know, we were first term online, of course. Um, the instructor said, well, I've taught this course online before. Um, I don't really like teaching online, so I don't have the whole syllabus developed. I've just got like the first three weeks and then we're just gonna kind of play it by ear after that. Oh my goodness. And it was like, oh, cringeworthy. Oh. Summertime took three courses, which was fine in terms of the workload and everything, but all three of the professors had GAs that had the same first name. Oh boy. So, you'd, so you'd get an email from Sue and Sue would be talking about the class and you'd have to try and remember, okay, which Sue is this and which class are we talking about? And you'd have to rifle back through all of their stuff as well. So, you know, my examples, unfortunately, have been the what not to do when you're teaching online more than what to do when teaching online. And I just have to say, you know, sitting here in this session and listening to you and what you've done has really kind of taken a bitter taste out of my mouth. 
because you've proven that it can be done. It's not horrible. It takes a little extra work on your part as well as from us, uh, you know, as students and quite frankly, as staff members supporting faculty just to figure out maybe how to encourage someone to do some of the things you've done. And I really appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, it's, it's scary putting yourself out there and trying new things. And it was scary for me to do, you know, the liquid syllabus and, you know, if links don't work, all those kinds of things, but it's all a learning curve. And at least you're trying and you're moving forward. And um, I think being honest with students, like, hey, this is something new we're trying and yeah, we'll see if it works. If it does great, if not, we learn something from it and then we move on from it. And so that's what I've tried to, to model for students and to do myself, but thank you. and I. I hope that maybe you can do a video like this for your class and share it with your instructor for a project or something. I don't know. Yeah, Kara. Um, I kind of want to mirror what Kathy said a little bit. Um, I, I, I come back to the learning environment after many years um, uh, of, I got my bachelor's degree um, and then I began working at Portland State and I decided, okay, now is a great time to get my master's degree. And uh, jumping into this environment, thankfully I had a year of classes before COVID, but um, all of a sudden everything is online and I had been avoiding taking any kind of online or hybrid classes because of being sort of afraid of, of misunderstanding the technology or where to find things. And what I'm figuring out as a student that I don't really know where to provide this feedback is that there's, there's no, I mean, they give this online system, which is not the Moodle system that you're using, but it's similar, I'm sure. Um, they give the instructors that, and then they let them kind of prepare things in their own way. And I think what I, when I think of this process, I think there's something to be said about having things be somewhat consistent. And what I'm finding is that that lack of consistency means I get to, you know, a good three, four weeks into the term before I feel like, okay, I understand the structure of how this instructor works. And I suppose people could say in an in-person class, it might take people a little while to get that. But what I'm finding is, you know, oh, this instructor doesn't put their their um, actual assignment information into the syllabus. They have it over here in a course description, and and there's you know ten different things that layer up, and oh, and then they have their weekly thing, and that drops down and. And over in the weekly thing, you find that here's the pre-reading and you need to have read these things because they're going to be for the breakout sessions in class. But that has nothing to do with the other things that they call homework. And it's so confusing. I'm just really confused. And with the fully online courses, um, even more so because there was no chance to, you know, it's like in the first couple of classes, we almost need a couple of breakout sessions just to talk to one another so that we can say, hey, anybody navigate to this thing and can you help me out here? I'm confused or lost or whatever. And in those first two online courses, I didn't bother to make time to meet with a professor even. So I just winged it, got through, got an A, and now I look back and I'm like, I don't even know what I learned. And so this class I'm in this term, I'm making a concerted effort to meet with the professor on a regular basis, but 
her stuff is so spread out all over the place that it's just literally like I can't even I don't even feel like I'm prepared when I walk into the class and so I'm I'm listening to you going oh there is there <laughs> is a perfect answer to this it just is not everybody's there yet but as somebody who wants to train adults I see this in a way I feel like I'm learning through the mistakes I'm I'm wafting through and so in a way that's giving me sort of the the school of hard knocks <laughs> but I I feel like it's really important that um that we work towards what is going to consistently um stay with us and I I just I wish that um I wish that there was a focus on that. Like, it's kind of like if you go to any McDonald's or Starbucks, you know that you're gonna get something that tastes just like it did at the one on the other side of town. Um, when you go and take a, a, a online course, each instructor is so different that that's not the case. And that's really unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I mean, it kind of goes back to what Kathy was saying. When you're in a course and there's not a lot of organization or the course instructor says, hey, I've only got three pages of the syllabus done. As a student, I would feel like, wait a second, am I a priority? Is this course a priority? Like, how is this not, how are we supposed to be successful when there's not a clear line of how to be successful? And like you said, it takes three or four weeks in a class to figure that out. Whereas in the face-to-face -face class, you usually can figure that out right at the beginning of class, during that first class, inside conversations with people sitting next to you on break with the instructor. You have all those opportunities, whereas in an online course, you really don't. And so it, it is extra steps on the, the part of the students to find that out. So as instructors, if we can kind of front load that and make it available and then support it throughout the course, the students can Put their energy into learning what we want them to learn not trying to learn the system that we've set up because i really want my students energy and attention to go towards the content of the course not how to find the content and where to submit it yeah absolutely so yes you can learn from bad examples what you don't want to do and unfortunately a lot of us have done that in education um, but there are a lot of great resources and so continuing to attend presentations like this, doing presentations like this, finding things that work for you and continuing to spread the word is the best way I have found to, to make that change. So thank you so much for coming and um, feel free to email me if you have any questions, anything additional. My slides are in the, um, the Dropbox, I guess, in Google Slides, but I can also put my email here if anyone wants to follow up or has any other questions for me. And I so appreciate you taking the afternoon with me, even though it may be snowing outside. <laughs> All right, thank you, Erin. And also I went ahead and posted the link um, to the feedback form for this session.